admit that I'm not really sure why I picked this scripture this morning. My dad asked me earlier in the week, he said, what, are you, what scripture are you using? And I said, I, I, I'm using Micah chapter 6. He goes, oh, the disciples scripture. And I'm just like, oh, I hadn't heard that before. You know, I wasn't sure what he meant. Um, so I, then all of a sudden when I was reading it, I started coming from a different angle. very well-known scripture, you know, one that we quote from all the time, you, you hear it quite often, except you usually only hear one verse, right? Verse 18. Um, and I see it used like as a calling sometimes, a, you know, a realization of what it truly means to be faithful and a I was a kid. It wasn't black and white still. Um, my sister and I used to love that. I was watching reruns. It was not the first run of it. So I wanted to make that clear that I was watching reruns. Okay? <laughs> right? Uh, that makes me feel a little bit better, but not too much. Uh, but it was great. You know, there was always some kind of mystery, you know, of who done it, you know, great who done it. Um, and you never know what's really going on until Perry in the middle of the courtroom, you know, towards the end of the show kind of has this epiphany and he figures it all out. And a little bit of trivia. I think he only lost one case, right? But I don't know which case it was. You know, I didn't look that up. But the drama would be right there in front of us, unfolding, you know, in front of our eyes. And he would suddenly ask a question that usually didn't have an answer. It was like a rhetorical question, which made the point he was trying to make and kind of answered exactly what was going on and who was at fault. Questions. They're kind of sharp, you know? They really are. It's sharps and it makes a point, and it's kind of like, 
ends the argument most of the time? By definition, a rhetorical question is a question asked in order to create a drama dramatic effect or to make a point rather than to get an answer. Here's some examples. Is the Pope Catholic? Is rain wet? Does, um, can fish swim? Can birds fly? Do dogs bark? Do you want to be a failure for the rest of your life? Ooh, doesn't that one hurt? It made, it just, when I was looking at this, it just made me cringe every time I read that. You know, it made, it didn't, it doesn't make me feel good, right? something about the audience or who's hearing it, right? They imply that someone is doing something that is obviously contrary to what is being said most of the time. The hearers think they may be doing something. Mm -hmm. They maybe think they're doing something that they're not doing or that they are doing, but you know they may be doing something totally else. And then a rhetorical question comes in, and it can sound harsh, but maybe points us in the way of the truth. Back to scripture. I gotta move some of this stuff. <laughs> I'm gonna have papers flying, just like I said earlier. So God be begins this trial in chapter 6 of Micah in verse 1. So this is God speaking. And God says, rise, plead your case before all the nations. And he's talking to the people of God, the Israelites in this instance. And then the prophet takes over and reiterates some of what God declares. And the people, you know, and, and presents the case how God and the people are in this conflict. And then God comes back in and takes over, I think, in verse 3, you know, and it's, it's almost this lament, you know, and then God demands an answer. You see high drama right here in the heavenly court. It's getting quite heated. God continues down through verse 5, laying down all the evidence. God is making a case against the people. And, and, and showing all that God has done. God lists, you know, the people that were sent. God sent these people to free them from bondage. You know, Moses, Aaron, Miriam. He even lists Balaam. I love that one. I do. And I'm going to have to go on a tangent. And I apologize. But Balaam is a great story. Yeah. You know, it goes back to Numbers, right in chapter 22 through 26, I believe. You know, and back then, Balaam was this well-known seer. You know, he was kind of a prophet of sorts. Um, and King Balak, I, I will warn you, I pronounce things funny. I'm, I'm, I just say them really fast, and hopefully y'all don't have a... You know, that's not right, but anyway. <laughs> king Balak... Balak, I believe Moabite king or Amorite king, don't quote me on that one, but he sends for Balaam to come to him because King Balak wanted Balaam to come and curse the Israelites. They were afraid, he was afraid of the Israelites coming into the land. He didn't want them to take over the land, so he calls Balaam. Hey, Balaam, I need a favor. Well, God gets in the mix. God tells Balaam, you better not go. Don't go. But eventually, Balaam's getting harassed on the other side by King Balak. Hey, you need to come here. And finally, Balaam goes. Well, God's not really happy with this. So, God sends an angel. A high archangel and everything to stop Balaam. 
Um, the first time as Balaam's on his way, Balaam, the angel appears, but Balaam doesn't see the angel. But his donkey does. And his donkey stops right, in, right then and there. And, and Balaam's like, what's going on? And he's, he beats his donkey with his stick. And then they start going again. Well, then the angel appears again, and the donkey sees him and veers off the side of the road. Guess what Balaam does? Beats the donkey with the stick. Well, then the third time comes around, and the angel appears right there in the middle of the road, and the donkey just lays down. And good old Balaam, being aware of all of his surroundings, be beats his donkey with his stick. And then, God comes in, and the donkey turns around to Balaam and asks him, Why are you beating me with this stick? Oh, isn't that awesome? Oh, I just love this story. Um, anyway, bit, bit of trivia. Let's see. Um, it's not a rhetorical question either. Um, animals talk in the Bible twice. This is... One time, you know the first? The serpent. Good. Yeah. The serpent. Yeah. It's just a great story in Numbers. Go back when you have time, read it. It's, it's like 22 through 26. I think Balaam ends up with his head on a stick. Um, so you got some drama and blood and, and gore if you want it. Um, it's a great, rich story. Balaam does not curse the Israelites. He ends up blessing them and really angers King Balak. So, anyway, God sends this person. Coming back to Micah, Balaam's one of the people that God sends to free the people from bondage. So then in verse 6, we get the people's response back to Micah. So at first we have God presenting the case. Then we have the prophet coming in, laying the case in front of us. And then we have God presenting everything that he has done for the people. And now the community spokesperson comes in for the people and responds. It's kind of like the defense attorney. Um, and then he lists everything that the people are doing. You know, the people are doing stuff. Um, and they want to prove their innocence and how they follow God. They list about all their burnt offerings, best of the best that they give God. And they then make a snarky response at the very end of their defense, which probably wasn't a good idea. And they say, hey, what else do you want us to do? Give up our firstborn too? Hmm. Well, that kind of promotes, you know, prompts a response. And the prophet steps in. Micah steps in after that little response. And then asks a sharp and telling rhetorical question. God has told you what is good. What does the Lord require from you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? You see the question mark at the end of that sentence? It's not a statement. It's not a calling. It's not a motivational phrase or a commission either. It's a question that does not have a response. It's a question that says it all. It says, yes, you have been doing all that other stuff been doing this and been doing that. But have you been doing the important stuff? Do you actually do justice? Love kindness? And walk humbly with your God? Or are you simply going through the motions? It's kind of scary. Hmm? We do live in turbulent times. You know, it wasn't all that long ago, I guess I shouldn't say that. 
it was all that long ago. It doesn't seem like it, but I wasn't born in the 60s. But during the 60s, we had so much unrest, and you can almost parallel, parallel the unrest we have today and back then. Um, but I was watching a Saturday morning news show, and there was this woman in New York who had am amassed all this memorabilia of the African American Civil Rights Movement. It's probably the biggest collection there is. Um, she's 90 years old, amazing lady, but it's going up for auction soon. I mean, it was incredible. But the camera was panning over all of this, you know, history right there that she had gathered. And a word jumped out that I kept on seeing repeated over and over again. And it was peace. On so many of the slogans, you saw the word peace. You know, it was a movement that at its heart was promoting peace, unity, harmony. And then I got to thinking today, we span the world, and I don't see that. I don't hear it. No one's now promoting peace. And I got to think, what are we doing to one another? And then I go back to scripture and I think justice. Hmm, do we hear those cries of, for justice? They can be found. Yet people are still being targeted because of the color of their skin, the shape of their eyes, who they love or know themselves to be. And don't you think it's ironic? It really is, think about this, that a random or even unrandom act of, act of kindness, it makes the news because it's so rare. All along, the church as a whole, the communities of believers seem to be silent lost in the wilderness. And so for so many years, we've, we've gotten so wrapped up in worship wars, trying to be that program-driven church, keeping up with the mega churches or the non-denominational churches of providing programs to people, and sometimes focusing on just keeping the doors open and building maintained. And I think all of us churches, but especially us mainline denomination, we've lost our way through the years by trying to be something we're not. We are disciples. As disciples, think about it. We have such a unique and openness inherent within us and we talk about it every Sunday. We have this open communion table at the heart of our service, which is not ours. We just invite everyone to it. We have a message of loving everyone, no matter where you have been or how you may interpret scripture or what you believe. We have a message of reconciliation, bringing people together because the message of Christ has no barriers, has no creeds or special exemptions. That's who we are. We have a message of open arms, come one, come all a message of loving hearts, of loving justice and kindness, and always trying to walk humbly with our God. That's who the disciples are. And now you find yourself in a very important time, trying in this discernment process in search of a new minister, and it's hard. 
And it's scary. But as you discern, remember how special you are. Be disciples. Who else do you want to be? Amen.